One must be careful about a purely pejorative understanding of the expression pre-Vatican II theology, of course. Now that I've given you all this bad feelings, even though there was a dominant theological view before Vatican II, as expressed in Salivari's treatise, and as practiced in the pre-Vatican II Mass, there was no uniform preconciliar theology. In the early and mid-20th century, we find not only the theology of the textbooks or manuals like Salivari's Summa, but also the theology of individual theologians whose work was not yet accepted at official levels, but who were, in fact, laying the foundation for the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Sometimes under great duress, under great persecution. Included among these theologians were the great Karl Rahner, Yves Kungar, Henry de Lubach, Edward Skillebeck, Hans Kjung, and the American Jesuit John Courtney Murray. Let's talk about Yves Kungar. The most important ecclesiologist of the 20th century, Yves Kungar perhaps did more than any other single theologian to prepare the way for the Second Vatican Council, the most important event in recent times for Christianity as a whole. Nine times out of ten, says Kungar, when a Catholic uses the noun church, he or she means hierarchy. Conservatives are not the only ones who are guilty of this. Liberals do this also, like when they criticize the church, or when explaining why they left the church, or enlisting the many ways the church has fallen down. They are actually, just like conservatives, identifying the church with its hierarchical pastoral leadership. Let's clean up our language, folks. Church should always refer to the whole people of God. As the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, number two says, following Yves Kungar, the church is the whole people of God. Everybody. Everybody. And since Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, Lex Credendi, Lex Orandi, that would demand that there has to be a change in how we worship. Yes or no? The Second Vatican Council's major themes are already anticipated in Conger's books. He wrote of the church as the people of God in his Mystery of the Temple. Within the people of God, the laity are called to full participation in the mission of the church. Whoa, can you imagine him writing this before Vatican II? Well, there would be no Vatican II without Yves Kungar. According to Kungar, the church is more than the Roman Catholic Church alone. According to Kungar, the mission of the church is not to grow and multiply and grow numerically, but to be a minority in the service of the majority of humankind. Not a besieged minority where we have the truth and everyone else is the orcs out in darkness. No, a minority serving the people of God. See what he's doing? He's going back to the sources. He's going back to the Gospels. Like the French underground during the Second World War, which would have impacted Yves Kungar, a Frenchman. Kungar sees the church as a... Notice what I say. All theology is rooted in human experience, and all human experience is culturally specific. Kungar sees the church as a small community which prepares the way for the salvation of all in the coming of the final kingdom, which is always now and not yet. 
The church exists in itself, but not for itself, writes Gungar. The church, ecumenically conceived, is always in need of reform, according to Yves Gungar. Even institutional and structural reform in its head as well as its members. This book, True and False Reform in the Church, for a long time was not translated into English, and in fact was even withdrawn from circulation long after Vatican II. Drawn, taken away from circulation in French because of its controversial content. Hmm, let's, let's scratch our heads and think for a minute. What happened after Vatican II that, are you saying, Bill, that there was like a movement after Vatican II that tried to get things to go back as if Vatican II had never happened? And that this movement is still going on? Maybe reflected certain pontificates? I don't know. Am I saying that? We'll have to look at that. Perhaps toward the end of this year. This is a very important work. The great Karl Rahner. Perhaps the greatest theologian the church has since Thomas Aquinas. Karl Rahner's principal theological contributions were not in the area of ecclesiology as such. If you keep repeating dogma, it will eventually become heresy. We cannot simply parrot dogma. Parrots cannot be faithful Catholics. Nevertheless, Karl Rahner prepared the way for Vatican II with his fundamental notion of the universality of grace. Grace is a priori, already available in every human place, everywhere, and even in the non-human world. It permeates everything, more pervasive than the brokenness of sin. That's one idea. And the correlative notion of the diaspora of the church. The idea that you can find a church even outside the church. In an essay published in 1961, but written earlier than that, entitled, A Theological Interpretation of the Position of Christians in the Modern World, Rahner notes that some events in the history of salvation ought not to be, but are and must be so. The crucifixion ought not to be, but it is, and therefore it must be. As an, as an action that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, it is a supreme injustice. Yes? So it ought not to be. And therefore was not really willed by God, in the sense that God is a sadist, Jehovah the Hutt. But did it happen? Did the crucifixion happen, folks? It did. So after the fact, we can say, well, that sounds like the Bible. After the fact, predestination. I like that. We can say it had to be. And God will bring good from it. Yes? Not because he's playing chess with people and writing all the scripts of everybody's lives beforehand. But jazz, God plays jazz. The existence of poverty ought not to be. But it is, and therefore it must be. It will be a theater of grace. I want to be Christian. Okay, are you in the theater of grace that is poverty? Helping your brothers and sisters in poverty? Not just giving uh, out food cans but fighting the structures of racism and privilege and problems that cause for the increase of poverty in the world? Poverty ought not to be. But it is, and therefore it must be. And so we must be church there. The Reformation 
ought not to be. It divided Christendom, right? But it is. And therefore God willed it in as much as it is. And is bringing grace about it. We ought not to look at the Reformation as evil. But as a beautiful thing that happened that allowed the crystallization of Christianity to occur. Western Christianity. Without it, we would not have a better understanding of what it means to be church. Ultimately, we would not have the Second Vatican Council without the Protestant Reformation. Thank God for it. Is that a different way of looking at history and time? That's one of looking at history and time and finding in it joy and hope and grace. That's the great Karl Rahner. God is to be found everywhere. He is the horizon of everything finite we experience. We can experience it as finite precisely because we are an openness to the background which is infinite. That's his argument for God. His transcendental argument. Human beings are the transcendental capacity for God precisely because we are that animal that experiences things as finite. Your cat does not do that. Your, your cat doesn't see its life as finite. It just is. It's enjoying it life just as it is. But humans, humans see things as with limits. Why? Because we are in openness to the no limit. That no limit horizon that is the backdrop of everything we experience and every limited experience we have is called God. If Rahner's argument is true, he's just proven God. Of course, it's not an argument that has, to, it's not like something you go through logically, just logically. You have to experience it. And you do by experiencing your mortality, by experiencing love, by experiencing uh, deep sadness, radical boredom. Okay. To Rahner, the minority scattered diaspora condition of the church is one of those musts of salvation history. This diaspora situation, Rahner argues, is not only permitted by God, but positively willed by God. And we must draw our conclusions from this. Not from idealistically what we want the church to be, but what, from what the church is. That is where we must work our understanding, our ecclesiology from. Radical existential understanding. The diaspora situation means that the church is no longer in possession and cannot act as if it were like a kingdom on the earth, like a Christendom. The age of Christendom is finished, and it must be, and it was positively willed by God to finish. The church must attract people on the basis of free choice, not on the basis of social convention, coercion, or political pressure. Those who belong to the church will belong to it as a matter of conviction, not of habit. Karl Rahner writes, Just where is it written that we must have the whole 100% of humankind? Just where is it written that God must have all in the Catholic Church, all of humankind? Why should we not alter to our use, quite humbly and dispassionately, a saying of St. Augustine's, many whom God has, the church does not have, and many whom the church has, God does not have. That changes everything. That changes how you view evangelization. Evangelization with this understanding cannot mean our job as Christians is to bring everybody into, the, into being baptized as members of the church. Think about in a parish ministry. Oh, that lady was Jewish. She came into the church. Oh, I feel so good. She's in the church. Why? Why do you feel real good? Okay, maybe she's with us. That's great and everything. You feel great because you converted her? Like, is this like a game, like a video game? So that's like to get a Jewish person, that's like a thousand points. 
Is this Pac-Man? Doom, 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 doom. Here comes a Jewish person, 1,000 points. It's ridiculous. What would Carl Rahner say about that? Is, that's a creative retrieval that Rahner does with Augustine. Edward Skillebeck. Another major theological influence before the council was Edward Skillebeck's Christ, the Sacrament of Encounter with God, first published in Dutch in 1960. I have this book. I love it. And translated into English in 1963. Classic. Classic. Skillebeck's argument is as follows. Apart from the sacramental principle that God is already in all limited things, that all things are pregnant with God, there is no basis for encounter between God and the human community. Why? Because God is totally spirit and we are bodily creatures. God is creator, we are creature. God is transcendent, we are limited. God is life. We are death. God is infinite. We're finite. Thus, it is only insofar as God adapts to our material condition that God can reach us and we can reach God. This kind of argument would not have happened if it hadn't been for the Protestants arguing God's radical otherness. The embodiment of the spiritual in the material and the communication of the spiritual through the material is the sacramental principle, says Skillebeck. Christ is the magnum sacramentum of God. Our chief way, His humanity, is our chief way of communicating with God and God communicating with us because a God addresses us through the humanity of Christ and we respond through that same humanity of Christ. The church, in turn, is the Grund Sacrament the fundamental sacrament who otherwise would be removed from our of Christ the church is our way of getting in contact with Christ who otherwise would be removed from our range of daily bodily existence he lived 2000 years ago right and he's resurrected but in glory the church is our way of getting into contact with him this is amazing stuff the seven sacraments of the church, therefore, finally, are the principal ways by which the church communicates the reality of Christ and of God, and by which we respond to Christ and to God in our worship. Through the moments of our lives, beginning to end. The essence of the church, therefore, according to Skillebeck, consists in this, that the final goal or of grace achieved by Christ becomes visibly present in the whole church as a visible society. The church is not only a means to salvation, it is the principal sign or sacrament of salvation. Take Skillebeck there with Karl Rahner's universality of grace, and we see that there are many who are being saved inside the church and outside the church. The church is a more explicit way of what God is already giving everywhere and always. That removes the magical understandings of the sacraments so many Catholics have. And that also explains some of our devotions with a magical emphasis of who alone has the right to carry this or that. Yes. Is, is this what the current Pope is using as a basis for the... Little He's been touched by these things. He's been touched by these things. Yeah, this, he, Pope Francis, heroically, is just trying to get us to go back in time about 52 years. That's it. 
for Catholics, for Catholic, only for Catholics, folks. Going back in time 52 years is being progressive. <laughs> only we can accomplish this feat. This, this theology has been around for a while. The church, according to Skillebeck, is not only an institution, but is a community. Indeed, it is an institutionalized community. <coughs> Christianity is not a message which has to be believed, says Skillebeck, but an experience of faith that becomes a message. Henry de Lubach. <laughs> a similarly sacramental perspective was advanced by the French Jesuit Henry de Lubach in his influential work Catholicism, a study of the corporate destiny of mankind. According to de Lubach, humanity is one, organically one by its divine structure. Notice with this statement, you cannot no longer have a document that is entitled the church and the world, the document now has to be called the church in the modern world and the world in the church. God emits best. Humanity is one, organically one by its divine structure. It is the church's mission to reveal to men that pristine unity that they have lost to restore it and complete it. The church, de Lubach insisted, is, quote, not merely that strongly hierarchical and disciplined society whose divine origin has to be maintained. If Christ is the sacrament of God, the church is for us the sacrament of Christ. And Skillebeck would agree with de Lubach. And so should our lives agree with what they're saying in words. Indeed, quote uh, de Lubach, it is through his union with the community that the Christian is united to Christ. John Courtney Murray. John Courtney Murray was not formally an ecclesiologist, although his best-known writings touched upon the relationship between the church and state and on the correlative questions of religious freedom. Remember, extra ecclesium nulla salus, outside the church no salvation, and the church has been invested with coercive force to ensure that the whole world submit to this perfect society. You all remember that, right? Okay. That brings into the question religious freedom. Isn't that part of human dignity? That I can choose to believe or not believe any number of belief and traditions? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Not invited to the first session of the Second Vatican Council because of his controversial views on these issues, Murray proved to be the major influence in the composition of the Council's Declaration on Religious Freedom. His pre-Vatican II contributions were done through scholarly articles and theological studies in which he subjected certain traditional teachings, especially those of Pope Leo XIII, to historical and theological reinterpretation. You know, when I go home, you put on EWTN, you watch The Journey Home. I wonder, has The Journey Home read this document, Declaration on Religious Freedom? They're coming home, right? If you're a Christian, say you're a Lutheran and you become a Presbyterian, or you're a Catholic and you become a Lutheran, or, you're, or vice versa, you realize you haven't left the home? You've gone from one room to another? You guys realize that? If you don't, you're pre-Vatican II with that.
But the Baptist friend of mine who always insults me doesn't know, well, that doesn't mean what his ramblings and rants are saying should determine how you view things, right? Especially not reality. Moray did not argue that the Leonine doctrine was false, but rather that it was archaic. It was based on a paternalistic rather than a constitutional concept of political authority. Pope Leo XIII's position was also formulated in the context of the continental laicist state, and Leo confused society with the state, just as they were confused in the philosophies of polytheistic and pagan antiquity, the times of Rome and empire. But given developments in Catholic social philosophy, in the 19th and 20th centuries, and in the political character of much of the world of Murray's day, the Leonine teaching simply can no longer hold. The idea that outside the church there's no salvation, that idea, for example, has to be modified. Right? Perhaps the church exists visibly and invisibly. Perhaps, in some way, the church already relates everyone in the world somehow. Over against this Leonine teaching, Murray argued for the four truths which came to be accepted as the as came to be t accepted in essence by the Second Vatican Council: one, the dignity of the human person, a principle which pervaded the doctrinal work of Pope Pius XII. Two, our human in, our endowment, our, as being humans, our endowment with natural rights and obligations, duties, also found in Pius XII, but developed by John XXIII in Pacem at Terrace, in Terrace. Three, the juridical nature of the state, meaning its primary commitment to the protection of human rights and the facilitation of duties. Again, Pius XII. So glad that governments around the world and the United States in its Kissingerian imperial ways has maintained uh, human dignity. Four, the limitation of the powers of government by a higher order of human and civil rights. Again, Pius XII, as elaborated upon by John XXIII. And you can see Murray's paper, The Declaration on Religious Freedom in Vatican II and Interfaith Appraisal, pages 565 and 76, with this discussion. Hans Kung. Hans Kung was only 33 when he published his The Council and Reunion. It was undoubtedly the single most influential book in the Council's preparatory phase because it alerted so many people in the Catholic world to the possibilities for actual renewal and reform through the medium of Vatican II. For Hans Kung, reunion of the churches depends upon their prior reform, including the reform of the Big C Catholic Church. This is always necessary because the church consists not only of human beings, but of sinful human beings. Oh, I thought it was a societis perfectus. Oh well. Although his book is remarkably comprehensive, its basic ecclesiological, I'm sorry, ecclesiological point is that, quote, the chief difficulty in the way of reunion lies in the two different concepts of the church. And especially of the concrete organizational structure of the church. Page 188 of the Council Reform and Reunion. The difference is most sharply focused in the question of ecclesiastical office, its origin, its powers, its scope of authority, and its forms. At the heart of the matter is the Petrine office. Hans Kung asks, do we need a pope? Well, here's the thing. We have to ask that question. People on the Catholic side with the old ecclesi ecclesiological view would say, you can't even ask that question. Protestants are all like, yeah, I don't have to ask it either. We don't need a pope. Pope's Antichrist. Well, if there's going to be reunion, we have to literally ask that question and grapple with it. And what kind of pope? 
If the Petrine ministry, and I believe it is, essential to the church, the structure of the church, what exactly is authentically Petrine? Pope Alexander the Sixth. So even we in this room who are Catholic would disagree with that extreme. Yes or no? Okay. So between that and no Pope at all, there are some options to be discussed. Yes? They have to be discussed if we're going to have reunion of the churches. That's what Kung's point is. Pope John the Twenty-Third, Kung noted, that's the Pope who started the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, was giving the papacy a whole new style. And perhaps in the process, eliminating or diminishing many of the historic objections to the office from the Protestant side of this dilemma. Almost all of the reforms Hans Kung argued for in this book were eventually adopted. The establishment of Episcopal conferences like the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, that's one of the reforms. The abolition of an index of forbidden books, we abolished that. The simplification of the liturgy, everything Kung argued for. Those reforms happened at Vatican II and after. And the final person to thank is, of course, the greatest pope of the 20th century. It's pope St. John XXIII. It is difficult to exaggerate the role played by Pope John XXIII in the total event known as the Second Vatican Council, even though he was to die between the first and second sessions in 1963. When elected in 1958, Pope John insisted that the, his was a, quote, very humble office of shepherd. He was not a super philosopher who answered every question. Wrote, writing long public, uh, published documents to be memorized. Nor was he showy. He was a shepherd. And that he intended to pattern his ministry after that of Joseph in the Old Testament story, who greeted the brothers who had once sold him into slavery with the compassionate and forgiving words, I am your brother, Joseph. When this new pope took possession of his cathedral church, the Lateran Basilica in Rome, he reminded the congregation that he was not a prince surrounded by the signs of outward power, but a priest, a father, a shepherd. From the beginning, he broke the precedent of centuries and visited the sick in the Roman hospitals the elderly in old age homes, and convicts in Regina Celli prison. Who does that sound like? Francis. Sounds like Francis. Yeah. Sounds like Benedict II. Benedict did that too. Sounds like John Paul II. These men have followed in his footsteps. Especially Francis. You met him? I was eight years old when he went to New York, and he came to our <laughs> church in Brooklyn. Well, that's a blessing. That's cool. Both ways that he met you too, Letty. <laughs> Every day, Pope John celebrated what was then known as the Dialogue Mass with responses from the people. On Holy Thursday, he washed the feet of selected members of the congregation, and on Good Friday, he walked in the procession of the cross. He wasn't carried. The New Style Pope first announced the Council of the Second Vatican Council on January 25th, 1959, and officially convoked it on December 25th, Christmas Day, 1961, with the hope that it would be a demonstration of the vitality of the Church, a means of rebuilding Christian unity, and a catalyst for world peace. Amen. This was a great Pope. In his address at the Council's solemn opening on October 11, 1962, the Pope revealed again his fundamental spirit of hope and even optimism about the future. He complained openly about some of his advisors who, 
though burning with zeal, are not endowed with much sense of discretion or measure. In these modern times, they can see nothing but prevarication and ruin. They're Debbie Downers. He called them prophets of gloom, who are always forecasting disaster, as though the end of the world were at hand. On the contrary, divine providence is leading us to a new order of human relations. Joy and hope. To carry out its purposes, the Second Vatican Council would have to remain faithful to the sacred patrimony of truth received from the fathers. But at the same time, it must ever look to the present, to the new conditions and new forms of life introduced into the modern world, which have opened new avenues to the Catholic apostolate. But a council was unnecessary at this time, the Pope insisted, if the preservation of doctrine were to be its principal aim. The substance of the ancient doctrine is one thing, says Pope John, and the way in which it is presented is another. Think about the doors that open there. This is not the time for negativism. According to John the 23rd, the church counteracts errors by, de quote, demonstrating the, valid I'm sorry, demonstrating the validity of her teaching rather than by condemnations. The council and the church in council are like Peter who said to the beggar in Acts, I have no silver and I have no gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Thus, the Church of Vatican II will spread everywhere the fullness of Christian charity, quote, than which nothing is more effective in eradicating the seeds of discord, nothing more efficacious in promoting concord, just peace, and the brotherly unity of all, charity. This means that the Council must work for the unity of the whole Christian family and for the unity of the whole humankind. The council now beginning rises in the church like daybreak, says Pope John, a forerunner of most splendid light. It is now only dawn.